So good evening, everybody, and welcome to the second guest lecture of the California Master Beekeeper Program of 2024. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce to you Dr. Brian Johnson. He's an associate professor in the Department of Entomology at UT Davis, and he received his PhD from Cornell University in behavior biology, which I'm pretty excited about because I'm I'm 100% sure it's going to inform his talk this evening about the division of labor in, in honeybee colonies. Um, so his research interests are quite broad. Um, he's uh, interested in animal behavior, theoretical biology, and genomics. So his research has used a combination of experiments, simulation models, and computational biology to explore the evolution of advanced socia sociality, mechanisms of social organization, and self-organization. So uh, Brian, I know this evening you are going to take us on a really for me anyways, exciting and very interesting journey on the division of labor in the honeybee colony. And please, if I've left any formal or informal um, pieces about you uh, out of the introduction, I invite you to fill us in because you're the expert on you. And we're gonna sit back and put our ears on and listen over the next 45 minutes with uh, great curiosity. Thanks for showing up tonight, Brian. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation and thanks for the nice introduction. So can everybody see my, my screen? Not yet. Me. Try it again. There we go. Yep. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the organization of a bee colony. Organization of work and division of labor are kind of synonymous terms in um, social insect biology. It's basically how the colony is designed, how it works, how the pieces come together. So there's two kinds of division of labor in a honeybee colony. There's the what some people call the fundamental division of labor, which is between the queen and the workers. That's a reproductive division of labor. I'm not going to talk about that today. Alina studies that. I imagine she gives a lot of lectures about that. I'm going to talk instead about the division of labor that occurs within the workers. They are they divide labor by age. They have what are called age casts, or it's sometimes called temporal polyethism. It also has a lot of names, but it's basically the division of labor within the workers. And then I'll also um, finish up by talking about the superorganism concept, because division of labor is actually one half of the organization of work in a bee colony. A uh, superorganism idea sort of explains how division of labor fits in, how it interacts with what's called social physiology to create a, a sort of cohesive, unified, you know, collective organization. So the honeybee has four age casts. I'll talk in sort of general terms about the principles of, you know, their system of division of labor, how it's organized, how it sort of develops. But then after that, I'll sort of give some, I'll, I'll, I'll go into some detail about what the different casts do in terms of their tasks task repertoire and how they work together and or they, how they work independently. So they're the newly emerged bees. They're sometimes called generals. They're the, the youngest bees. And, the, and there's the nursing phase, the nursing cast, the middle-aged bees are the next cast, and then the foragers are the, the final cast. I should say that all social insects have, almost all social insects have a division of labor in the workers. 
In simpler societies like bumblebees and paper wasps, it's not as derived as in larger societies like honeybees or leaf cutting ants. And then even in the uh, ants that have physical casts like the leaf cutter ants, these, this is the, these are the physical casts of a, a leaf cutter ant colony. They also have age-based division of labor and the age-based division of labor in, men, in most ants is much more pronounced and important than are the physical casts. Because in many cases, the, the most ants that have physical casts have a big giant soldier. The soldiers don't actually do very much except defend the nest. And so when the nest isn't under attack, the soldiers are literally doing nothing. And then these middle-sized ants have a, a, an age-based system of division of labor, just like the honeybee does. And those ants do most of their work in a way that's pretty analogous to how the, the honeybee colony works. So a temporal cast refers to bees that are specialized on a task set. So they have a they have a task repertoire, which is to say they don't have a, a single cast, a, a single task thing that they do. They do sort of a number of things. And all the different things that the colony does are sort of broken up into these four different repertoires. So the the newly emerged bees do a number of things, the smallest number of the nurses have a number of things they do, as do the middle-aged bees and, and the foragers. And so the idea is that they, they have this task repertoire. They do tasks within that repertoire. They don't do tasks outside their repertoire. So in order to for a, a nurse to do a middle-aged bee cast, a middle-aged bee task, she has to switch into that, into that cast. That's kind of the idea. So it's a behavioral phenomenon, but it's also um, developmental and physiological in ways that we're going to talk about in, in a moment. And so even though the bees all look the same, the nurses and the middle-aged bees and the foragers from the outside, internally their bodies are quite specialized for what they're doing. They're sort of a, a nurse bee physiological state and a endocrine state and a developmental state and the same for all of the other casts. So as we'll see, in the, as I sort of develop this idea, essentially what's going on is bees are going through puberty multiple times and at every one of these, after every one of these transitions, they specialize themselves to play a particular role in the nest. So most, most organisms have a system that's like this, but simpler. Evolution never pretty much starts from scratch. It always takes sort of what's there and then changes it, you know, it makes it more elaborate, basically it makes it more derived in order to, you know, uh, all the new trait. And so the, the temporal polyethism system, the age cast system of the honeybees, is sort of a very derived form of the development that all organisms, we have it, most animals have it. So there's a juvenile form in most organisms like ourselves, in which animals engage in, and mammals anyway, in play behavior, they have incomplete muscular development, they don't have, you know, they're not, their behavior is constrained to things that are associated with their life history, with their, with their phase and life. Then at some point they go through puberty, at which point their their, homo their hormonal titers change and hormones control gene expression. And so when you get major changes in hormone levels, you get changes in gene expression across the body that help the animal produce secondary sexual characteristics, their behavior changes, they're interested in things that are different than they were when they were when they were juveniles. And so behavior and physiology changes after after puberty. And then the hormonal changes facilitate all of this. And so the idea is that bees are going through puberty three times. So evolution has sort of taken this this standard sort of developmental process whereby there's a juvenile and an adult form and allowed the and, and caused the social insects to go through this fate, this transition multiple times. And at every time they go through these transitions, they become specialized for playing a role in the nest. And so instead of being specialized for juvenile or adult behavior, they're specialized to be a nurse or a food processor, middle-aged bee, or a forager. But the biology is very similar. And so the people who study, like myself, division of labor from a genetic genomic perspective are looking at you know, what hormones change and how those hormones change patterns of gene expression across the body in ways that are you know, analogous to how changes in gene expression happen in our bodies when we transition from juvenile. So this is sort of a summary of what I've been talking about. Uh, each of these casts has a distinct physiology. They have a distinct hormonal state. 
And then that hormonal state is causing specialized gene expression across their whole body to specialize them for the role that they're going to play in the nest. And so to flesh out these casts a little bit more, there's the first uh, uh, um, newly emerged bees. These are in that state typically up until day four. Well, really day three. By day four, they're a nurse. They tend to stay a nurse until about 12 days of age. Then they become a, a middle-aged bee. Sometimes these are called hive bees as well. They stay in that state for about 10 days. And then usually at about three weeks, this is all in the, the, the spring, summer. Um, at about three weeks, they become foragers. And once they become foragers, they stay foragers until they die, which is usually about three weeks after, after that. So as we'll see when I talk about some experimental data about division of labor, there's a lot of flexibility and sort of in, in how bees move through the system. But that's sort of the, those are sort of the means, sort of, you know, that's how it works in the in the in the in the coarse grain. It's, it's sort of a coarse grain perspective. So something that's important to to sort of keep in mind that I've been sort of um, reinforcing and referencing is that it's not just a behavioral phenomenon. It's very much a physiological phenomenon. And so every time the bees are changing and cast, they're they're optimizing their whole body for their new role. So for social insects, that their their endocrine their um, their glandular system is quite important and it's really it, it happens in all the tissues but it's really pronounced in the glands so the hypopharyngeal glands for example these large glands in the head are the glands that make brood food in nurses they make um, nectar processing enzymes and foragers and so the the gland is specialized depending on what the, the bees are doing same thing for the mandibular glands. Uh, and also all pretty much all of the glands. So some of the, so some of the glands are not are they all have distinct cast specific patterns of behavior. Sometimes they're changing in function from one cast to the next, and sometimes they're only active in one cast. And so a good example of that are the wax glands. The wax glands are inactive in the newly emerged and the nurse bees. They get turned on in the middle age bees because the middle age bees make the nest. And then when they become a forager, these glands become deactivated again and they atrophy. Same thing with the uh, venom gland, for example. It's not active in the newly emerged bees. The venom sac is empty. It starts to fill up when, they, when they're when they right around the middle age phase. By the time they're a forager, it's full. Pretty much all of these glands are changing in those in those sort of ways, as, as are the, the rest of the tissues in the body. So there's a lot of muscle physiology that's different between the foragers and the, and the younger bees. Brain is different. Pretty much the whole body is different you know, as the bee transition from one gas to the next. Here's some old data that sort of illustrates what I was just talking about. And so this is the hypopharyngeal gland size by age. And so even at this sort of coarse grain level of resolution, you can see how much the gland changes as the bee ages. And so when the bee first emerges, if the gland is quite small, it reaches its maximum size at about four days, four to five days of age, which was the transition to nursing, if you remember. And then at the transition to middle age bees, which happens about 12, 13 days, it falls off rapidly in size. And, and then it reaches its lowest size in foragers. So this is the, the gene expression of the invertase gene. This is the gene that, that helps turn nectar into honey. It breaks down sucrose into fructose and glucose. And so, when the gland is at its largest size, as I mentioned, in a nurse in a nurse bee, it's producing brood food. And so, if I were to show gene expression, there would be a lot of royal jelly proteins being produced when they're young. And this invertase isn't being produced at all when the bees are young. But then, when the gland is small in the forager state, it's producing a lot of invertase. And so, the foragers are collecting nectar, and they're using the same gland to add these enzymes to the nectar to process it into honey. So, it's a good example of how the gland is changing in function from one cast to the next. And, you know, graphs like this could be shown for almost all of the glands and, and lots of things. So the casts are kind of like cogs in a machine. Each bee is specialized to play a, a particular role in the nest. And this specialization involves behavior and physiology. So the, again, to sort of give a a, you know, a, a big picture sort of perspective on, on what's going on. 
So now we're going to talk about the the cast in sort of more detail from a behavioral perspective, the natural history of the cast, what they do and how they, a little bit about how they work together, but mostly how they, what, what they do in terms of dividing labor. So the newly emerged bees, these are the bees that are just chewing their way out of the, the cells. I'm sure you've seen this in your hives. When they come out, they're furry. Their exoskeleton isn't hardened yet. It hardens in the first day after they emerge. These bees actually don't do much work. All they do is they stay in the, the brood zone and they clean cells. Cleaning cells is the 90% of what they do. And there are usually a lot of cells to clean when bees emerge. So I'm sure you've seen in your hives that the queen, if she's laying a nice brood pattern, the whole center of the frame is brood. She lays eggs, she lays a lot of eggs quickly. And so she'll fill up a whole frame quickly. And when the bees start to emerge, a whole frame will merge pretty much at the same time. And then, the, and then there are thousands of cells that need cleaning. And so it's a, a huge burst of work that's needed right after these bees are hatched, right, up, right after they emerge, and then they they do that task. Other than that, they, they stay in the brood zone where it's warm and they eat pollen and they continue their development. And so if they don't get pollen in this early phase, it, it radically changes their life history from that point forward. They sort of haven't completed their development when they emerge, unlike most insects. They have to eat pollen, and continue development in order for them to transition into the nursing nest. But in general, overall, the newly emerged bees don't do much work. Most of the work in the nest, well, all the work really is, is divided between the these, these last three categories. So the nurses feed the queen and the young. Their name is kind of a, a bit of a misnomer in that what they're famous for is caring for the brood, and they certainly do that. They rear the brood, they produce brood food, they monitor the, the, the larva and make sure they're getting enough food. But actually about half of the brood food that they produce goes to the adult bees. So they're not just the, the protein source and the fat source for the young, they're actually the protein and fat source for all of the bees in the hive, the adults as well. So some studies in the 90s showed that. You can trace, you know, the the the, the movement of the brood food through the nest, and about half goes to the larva and half goes to the adult bees. And of course they feed the queen. And so they they basically feed the queen according to how much they think she should lay. And so I think a lot of things that people associate with having a bad queen are actually not probably having a bad queen. The colony is just in a bad state. So the queen lays eggs according to how much she's being fed. She's not really in charge of anything. She's kind of an egg laying machine. So the the workers feed her more or less. They get her ready to swarm. She's not really, she doesn't really have access to any of this information. The nurses are processing the information and then controlling her behavior. She's not controlling them. So, so oftentimes when you see a queen not laying, it could be that she's a bad queen. It could be that the colony doesn't, for whatever reason, is not, you know, telling her to lay. They're not feeding her. The nurses also actually help queens spread her signal. It's an interesting thing that they do. So if you, I'm sure you've noticed the retinue behavior in your hives where you have a queen and there's a, a, a circle of attendants around her antenating and licking her. So what they're doing is the, the queen produces the, the queen right signal from her mandibular glands that lets the colony know that they have a queen who's who's healthy and, 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 and fertile. It suppresses the, it also suppresses the ovaries of the workers, this signal. But the queen is one worker, right? And she has to tell, she has to send her signal to tens of thousands of bees. And it's not a volatile signal, which means it's not just going to disperse through the environment like a perfume, more of a waxy contact sort of chemical. And so it has to be physically transferred all throughout the nest for the rest of the colony to receive this signal. So these, the bees in the retinue are called messenger bees. But after they finish antenating and licking the queen, they get the signal all over themselves, and then they run all around the hive, basically tracking the the odor, the the signal, the pheromone everywhere, and basically spreading her signal around. So Tom Seeley in the seventies did some work showing that that after the bees leave the retinue, they then run all over the hive, spreading the queen signal everywhere. But all in all, the nurses. Have a, are quite specialized. They basically stay in the brood zone. They feed the brood. They feed the, the queen. They via trophallaxis. They feed the adults as well. They eat pollen. They'll they work um, in the brood zone. They'll they'll 
trim cells, they cap root, they'll repair damage there. They do wax working in that area, but they don't build new comb. So the majority of the within nest work is done by these by the next cast, which are the middle aged bees. So they have two main roles in the nest, which is to process food. And then the other main role is to build the nest. And so if you think about it, these are huge tasks in the in the honeybee. Honeybee stores like 40 pounds, you know, of honey for the winter, depending on where, you know, where which bees we're talking about at what at what, you know, at for zone or, or tropical bees. They basically are storing a huge amount of honey for such a small insect. And so they're making a huge amount of food and storing it. And then their nests are quite large. As you can, as you guys, I'm sure you've seen in your colonies and also these wild nests, that's a huge amount of wax. It's a, it's a, it's a derived structure. It takes a huge amount of effort to build the nest and to process all of the food. And so something that I sort of come back to a lot is some of the other people that study division of labor, you may have heard this if you've heard other talk, other scientists talk about division of labor and, and honeybees. They tend to talk about the nurse bee forager sort of transition, the nurse bees and the foragers, as though there's nurses and foragers, and those are the major categories or the only categories in the honeybee. And I would say, if that's true, then who who processes all the food and who builds the nest? You know, it's a gigantic in terms of labor. It's a, a lot more labor to process the food and build the nest and honeybees than it is to feed the young. You know, it's a huge amount of work. And so the middle-aged bees are not like an additional or accessory or an, an additional kind of thing. They're fundamental to the, the colony. So the two things, the two types of food they process obviously are the nectar. So nectar is mostly water and it's mostly sucrose usually. It has minor sugars as well and ash and other things, but usually the largest sugar is sucrose. And so in honey, the largest sugar is fructose and glucose, which is why it tastes so much different than table sugar. Table sugar is sucrose. So the processing of it involves transitioning its chemical composition and also dehydrating it. So in terms of labor, the dehydration part is a lot of work. And so the middle-aged bees, the, the foragers collect the nectar in the field. They come back to the hive. At the bottom portion of the hive, they unload their nectar loads to these middle-aged bees. That's a nectar receiving task, which is in the, the middle-aged bee task repertoire. And then those middle-aged bees walk it up to the honey zone, which is usually at the top of the nest. They then dehydrate it in this behavior called tongue latching, which is they, they put their mandibles out, they spread a drop of nectar in between their mandibles, and then they lash their tongue through it repeatedly to cause evaporation of the water from it. And they're continuously taste, taste, tasting it with their tongue. And so when it reaches, when it's right, when it reaches the right amount of water content, it's done. And then they put it into a, a honey cell and then they walk back down and get a new load of nectar from one of the foragers. And then they walk back up and do it again. So that's their nectar processing behavior. The other thing they do is they process the pollen. So pollen is also not stored as a raw product in the hive. It's stored as what's called bee bread. And so here it's it's pretty similar. The bees are essentially, essentially processing the pollen somewhat and then storing it in a perhaps in a manner that, that is more conducive to long-term storage. People argue about how much better, you know, fresh pollen is versus bee bread. But for whatever reason, they, they spend a lot of time making bee bread. So they, they basically collect the, in this case, the foragers don't hand off the pollen pellets. They're, unhand, they're unhandy, they can't do that. And so the pollen foragers come back, they unload the pollen themselves. They walk around the hive, usually to an area near the brood. They find an empty cell or a cell that already has some pollen in it. They kick off their pollen loads. And then a, later, a middle-aged bee will see that there's two fresh pollen pellets in the cell. And then she'll come in and chew it up, and mash it up. You can see her sort of going in and out of the cell, mashing the, the pollen as she does. And she adds some nectar to it. Perhaps she's adding some enzymes as well that change the composition. People still argue about to what extent that happens. But definitely it looks like a processed, I'm sure you've seen pollen in your hive. It's a processed sort of product. And it takes the bees a considerable amount of time and effort to, to do the pollen packing. The behavior is called pollen packing. So that's the majority of what they do. Middle-aged bees also do a huge number of, of smaller tasks. They guard the nets, the guard bees, the bees at the entrance with their legs up, you know, in, inspecting the, the bees as they come in to make sure that they're colony mates and not robbers. Those are middle-aged bees. 
Uh, undertakers, the bees that remove dead bodies are also middle-aged bees. The bees that work propolis, they spread a thin layer of propolis all over the interior of the, the hive. On the wax and also in a tree cavity, those are also the middle-aged bees. That's one of those things that in one of those tasks that in nature is much larger than it is in a in a in a Langstroth hive. So in nature, when bees occupy a, a cavity in a tree, it's usually full of rotted wood. That's why there's a cavity there in the first place, because the tree is rotten right there. And there's a lot of fungus and other things that could potentially be bad for the bees. And so when they move in, they spend a huge amount of time chewing out and getting rid of all that rotten, punky wood. And then when they get to the nice hardwood, then they then they put a nice thick layer of propolis all around the interior of the of the tree cavity, which probably prolongs the life of the tree and also makes it drier and safer for the bees. And so it's another activity that takes a lot of effort. And in nature, it's super important. But in our hives, we already give them hard wood. And so they still spend time putting propolis everywhere, but they don't get the same triggers to, to lay down a lot of propolis because there's not rotten wood there. So but it's still important, and, and Barla Spivak and her co-authors have shown that the more propolis they collect and put in the hive, the, the healthier they seem to be. They do other things like washboarding. If you've seen bees washboarding, that's sort of the behavior that's involved with planing down rotten wood. They sort of use their mandibles like a plane, and they scrape back and forth. They're scraping basically wood to get down to hard to hardwood. They do it periodically kind of as a sort of like general maintenance. They do a ton of it when they move into a tree cavity. But they'll do it generally as a sort of maintenance thing. Or when they don't when they don't like the surface, when it's rough or there's like a, a chemical on it that they don't like and they want to get rid of it, then they do this washboarding behavior to plane down the wood to get rid of it. So then the foragers are the last cast. And so when a bee becomes a forager, she typically doesn't work in the nest at all anymore. The only exceptions to that are the foragers do thermoregulation activities. And so when it's really hot, you see bees fanning and doing the, the they spread water, they fan their wings, they do this tongue, tongue lashing behavior again, but with water. Foragers will help with that. But other than that, they don't really work in the nest. And I guess the other thing they do at the nest is defense. My, I personally think the foragers do most of the defense in a honeybee colony. The robbers, I mean, the, the guards are few in number. I think they, they trigger, they sort of alert the colony to a threat. But then the bees that do most of the stinging, I think, are the foragers, which is why you tend to get stung the most in the bottom story of your hive, because that's where all the foragers are. The top story is the middle-aged bees are processing honey. And then if there's, and then you get to the brood zone. If the brood zone is away from the bottom story, then those are mostly nurses. And if once you get to the bottom story, that's where all the foragers are hanging out. And they're the most likely to sting you. So I think... They're the most likely also to do defense. But in general, they collect four different things. They collect nectar, pollen, water, and propolis, usually in that ratio. Most of the bees are usually collecting nectar unless there's just a huge demand for pollen, which periodically happens. So if it's really rainy, the bees can eat all of the pollen in the nest and be down to nothing. And then when the, the weather gets better, they'll go out and, and collect a huge amount of pollen. They can, they can really rapidly, you know, and, and amazingly upregulate the amount of pollen for it. But usually there's more nectar than pollen foragers because they only collect a certain amount of pollen and no more. And so they have sort of a, a homeostasis for a pollen collection. Because given the number of brood they have, they collect a certain amount of pollen, and then they try to maintain that level of pollen. Whereas at all times, they're trying to collect all the nectar they possibly can. Right? So just they have no limit on how much nectar they want to collect. They know how much pollen they want, and once they get it, they don't collect more. And they, they, they basically try to create a steady state. The amount that they're eating, they try to balance with how much more they're collecting each day. Same thing for water. They collect as much water as they need, which isn't a huge amount. And so maybe a few percent of the bees are collecting water at any given time, unless it's a heat spell and they're doing a lot of thermoregulation, at which point they can upregulate the water collection a lot. But typically, only a few percent of the bees are collecting water. And same for propolis. You know, one or two percent of the foragers are collecting propolis all the time. And then they're, they don't really upregulate it and downregulate it so much. You can induce them to collect more propolis. You can sort of create a hole in your hive and put a screen there. And then the bees will cover the screen with propolis. People do that when they commercially produce propolis. You can get them to to collect a little bit more that way, but they'll never upregulate it the way that they do for nectar and pollen. Because nectar and pollen are the really important things for them. So 
those are the two things that they collect in bulk. Something that's, you know, interesting, and I think not appreciated by a lot of people is that building on what I just said is that when the colonies are not collecting pollen, it doesn't necessarily mean there's no pollen available in the field. It can also, and I think it more often means they don't need more pollen. If they don't have a lot of young larvae, or, or at, at, if they don't have a lot of larvae to feed, they don't collect, and they have a lot of pollen already, they naturally just won't be collecting much pollen. And so I think a lot of people feed protein supplement at times where the bees don't need it. You know, I know my advisor in grad school, Tom Seeley, has been beekeeping for like 40 years, and he's never fed protein supplement once. And I know a lot of people like that, you know, that I think the feeding of protein supplement is good for the people that make protein supplement. And I think it's also good if for, it's one of these things that's good for the commercial people much more than the hobbyist. And so if you're a commercial operator, especially here in California, and your apiary has a hundred colonies in it, then of course you have to feed them everything. There's, there's no landscape that could conceivably support an apiary with a hundred colonies. And many apiaries have 200 colonies or even more, right? And so there's a lot of discussion about planting and, and limits of, you know, that we're not, we're not sort of husbanding the environment correctly. We're not planting enough flowers and so forth. And there's, there's truth to that, but it's also not true in the sense that literally no matter what you plant it out there, there's no way there's going to be enough food for an apiary with 100 to 200 colonies. That's sort of the bee equivalent of feedlot cattle, right? And so Cows can take care of themselves when, when they're free range, as long as there's not too many of them for the for the habitat. And bees are just the same. They're perfectly capable of taking care of themselves, and especially in terms of getting food. You know, the, the mites are a different thing. But with, in terms of getting food, as long as there's not too many of them out there, they're perfectly capable of getting all the food they need. It's only when you overload the environment. And so the commercial people are routinely overloading the environment to an extent that's just like feedlot cattle. Whereas if you're a hobbyist and you live in the middle of a really big city and you have two colonies in your backyard, there's usually a huge abundance of, of forage around you from all the ornamentals that people plant and all the other trees and things that are around you. And so I mean, I'm not saying don't feed pollen, but you know, I, I think a lot of people are feeding pollen when they don't need it. So that's it so for, so the, for the natural history. I'm gonna switch gears now and talk a little bit about some experimental work on division of labor. So the early studies in division of labor, this is a famous study by Tom Seeley. It's basically, a, this study even is a, a, a sort of, um, a, he did, this is basically a, a redo of a study from the 1930s by a person in Carl von Frisch's lab. And so this, this same basic experiment was done in the 1930s. And then Tom did it again with somewhat more resolution in the 80s. But it sort of represents the art early perspective on division of labor. So you may have seen this figure before. And so the, the way this experiment worked is they, he, they get newly emerged bees, which are easy to collect, then put a, a paint mark on their back and a different paint mark for different cohorts. And so in this case, I think there's just one cohort. So you get all these newly emerged bees, you put a paint mark on their back, you introduce them to an observation hive, and then every day you do scan sampling of the hive and you make a note of what all the bees are doing. So every at, at every age, you get a distribution of activities. And so at age five, you know, most of the most of the bees are doing these tasks, which are nursing tasks. And then at age 15, a lot of these tasks down here, which are these receiving nectar, packing pollen, storing nectar, middle age tasks. And then by age 25 here, but by 21, you're getting a lot of bees that are, that are foragers. So it's sort of a coarse grain, low resolution perspective on what I just mentioned. That, that That's where this idea comes from, that there's the the newly emerged bees, the nurses, the middle-aged bees, and then the foragers. And then there's a bunch of activities that are not cast related, like grooming each other. They're, they're in the middle here. They're called throughout the nest. Grooming each other, feeding each other, ventilating, shaping comb. There's things that sort of all the bees do that are not part of the caste system. And then there's things that are part of the caste system, like the feeding of the brood and the, the processing of the... Uh... So this data set left some questions unresolved, like sort of how discretized are the caste sets, which but meaning sort of do the caste repertoires overlap? I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And then of course, how quickly can they switch castes? Can they, can they quickly switch from being a nurse a middle-aged bee or a middle-aged bee 
So I'll talk about some data that I collected on the on the first of these questions. I have collected data on both of them. I could talk about the other one and the question and answer if you're interested. So by whether or not the task repertoires overlap, I mean, if you look at, say, 10, a 10 day old B, for example, some of them are already doing these middle age tasks, 10 and 11. There's some bees that are already packing pollen, already processing nectar. There's also a big um, of, of you know activity in the feeding brood and capping brood, which are the nursing tasks. And so is that because some bees transition early and some bees transition later to being middle-aged bees? So are, in other words, are some 10-day-old bees nurses and some 10-day-old bees middle-aged bees, or are some 10-day-old bees doing both nursing and middle-aged cats? That's kind of the, that's kind of the, the point. So I did a follow-up study to Tom's study in which I identified the bees by their task and not by their age. And so I marked a large number of bees that I saw either nursing or processing nectar. And I put individual tags, little plastic tags with numbers on their backs, kind of the, the kind that we use for queens. So that I could follow them as individuals and not just by age as a as an age cohort. And then I followed each bee for about half an hour. And I, I sort of scanned until I found one of these bees that was active. And then I then watched her for half an hour. I did it over and over until I got about 50 bees in of the that were identified nursing and 50 bees that were identified doing the nectar processing. So here's the data. So there's, as I said, there's there's tasks that are not cast related, like walking around, standing around, inspecting cells, grooming each other. And so these tasks don't show a cast, much of a cast signal, which wasn't expected. And then these, these other tasks are the ones that are nursing related and middle age bee related. So the open bars are the bees that I identified doing the nectar processing and the, the, the dark bars are the bees that I identified nursing. So as you can see, the bees that I identified as nurses, they didn't do these middle-aged tasks, except for building comb. And so as I mentioned, the nurses will do a little bit of comb building in the brood zone. If, they're, if, they, if there's some damage in the brood zone or for, what, or for whatever reason, there's some part of the brood zone that needs building, they will do it. But they don't really go to the periphery and build brand new fresh comb. And they don't do very much of it in terms of how much the middle age is. And then vice versa, the bees that I identified as food processors were not seen feeding the, the, the brood and doing nursing. I should say there's a little bit of, I should, that what's interesting here is that the, the clearest diagnostic tasks are actually capping the brood and capping the honey cells. And so if you, if you, if you go by feeding brood, it, that's actually a hard task to identify, right? Because you can't see what they're doing inside the, the cell. And so if you see a bee go into a brood cell and she's moving around and she, you assume that she's feeding the larva, right? But she could just be inspecting the cell, you know? And so middle-aged bees walk all over the place looking in cells. And so you can usually differentiate by how long they stay in the cell. The nurses stay in the cells for much longer, the, the brood cells much longer than the middle-aged bees do but there's necessarily some error because you can't actually see what they're doing inside of there. Same thing with, with unloading honey. You can't actually see what they're doing in that cell. They could be drinking the honey or they could be unloading more honey into that honey cell. But what you can't misidentify is capping a brood cell. In order to cap a brood cell, you have to be sure that the larva in, inside has completed development and she's ready to pupate, right? So that's a decision that a nurse has to make. A nurse has to go inside the cell, sense what state the larva is in, sense that the larva is ready to be capped and then cap it, right? And you never see middle-aged bees doing that. That's one of these tasks in which I never saw a middle-aged bee doing that. Same thing for the honey processing. If you're going in there and you're and you're processing and making honey and you're tasting the, uh, the honey to make sure it's, it's been ripened and it's ready to go and then you cap it. And I didn't see any 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 uh, nurse bees involved with capping, capping honey cells. Which made me, which convinced me pretty much that the cast repertoires are pretty distinct. You don't have bees that are acting as both nurses and middle-aged bees any more than you have bees that are both middle-aged bees and foragers. They're either in one state or the other for the most part. But I did do a follow-up study because scientists have to prove everything multiple ways to sort of you know, 
convince skeptics. Skepticism is something that's not as big in science as it should be at this point in time. I think we have a lot of sort of like hand holding and like patting each other on the back and not fighting with each other enough. I think science is a kind of science is supposed to work via, you know, people having ideas and other people trying to rip the ideas down. And then if the ideas survive all of this nasty attempts to rip them down, then we know that they're really good ideas. And so while cooperation and teamwork sounds awesome, and people saying that you know, science is my team, teamwork, and that's about, yeah, that sounds nice, but it doesn't, it also, it, it also involves creation of like echo chambers where everybody's on the same team and nobody's really trying very hard to disprove each other. And, and in my experience, and especially from my experience of scholarship, looking at the history of science, that's usually not a good thing. It makes people feel good that everybody's you know, happy and nobody's being embarrassed at talks by somebody ripping and embarrassing them and proving them wrong and stuff. You don't like that, but that's you know how we get rid of bad ideas and how we, you know. And so anyway, that's sort of me on, me on a tangent. I think we need more competition and less handholding and, and, and stuff. And you, obviously you need a balance. You don't want it to just be like Lord of the Flies where everybody's like a pirate knifing everybody you know, left and right. You want sort of a nice, healthy balance between competition and cooperation. At present, I think we have way more cooperation than we have competition, which is sort of what I'm saying. But as I said, that that pattern of having a 10-day-old bee, for example, seeing the, those 10-day-olds doing both nursing and middle-aged bees, could be because some bees at 10 are already are nurses, and some bees at 10 are already middle-aged bees. That's what I showed in this second study. So in this study, I marked a whole bunch of bees at, at emergence with tags instead of with paint marks so I could follow them throughout their whole life inside the nest and see at what age they transition from being a nurse to a, you know, a middle-aged bee to a forager. And this, these are, I found a bunch of different patterns, but these, these two, these three different groups are not representative of the frequency. They're sort of just illustrative of the different patterns. And so the overwhelming majority of bees are, are like part eight. They go through their nurses, then their middle-aged bees, then their foragers, but they vary slightly in the age at which they become a, a middle-aged bee. So this first bee became a middle-aged bee at age nine, this one at age 10, this one at age 12, this one at age 13. But they all went through the same sequence in terms of their switching from one cast to the next. So there's just variation in the age at which they did it. But then I did see some bees that did do both casts for a day or two, or even a few days. But these bees were pretty rare. And so out of the hundreds of bees that I identified, maybe a few percent were like this. And then I found a, a reasonably larger percentage, but still a minority, that skipped the, the, the middle age cast altogether. They went straight from being nurses to becoming foragers. And a lot of people that study bees that do this in the past, they're often called precocious foragers. They're foragers that, they're bees that start foraging really early relative to what most bees do. And my suspicion at the time of doing this experiment was that these bees were actually sick. And so I think that when, when bees get sick, they, they almost immediately start transitioning to foraging, no matter what age they are. And then subsequent work after the study proved that, showed, showed that when bees are sick, they skip the middle age cast and they become foragers early and their overall lifespan is much long, is much lower. And so the colony has a higher all, a higher overall level of mortality when this seed sort of pattern is occurring. So that's it for sort of division of labor. I, I think I have five more minutes before we get to 45 minutes. So I'll sort of run through the superorganism concept. So division of labor is basically an organizational structure, but when you have an organizational structure, you have to have coordinated mechanisms to make sure that the thing works with a unity of purpose. And that's true for, for organisms like ourselves. Our bodies are also collectives where we're a society of cells instead of a society of organisms, but it's the same principle. And so the superorganism idea is that there's convergent evolution, the same basic design pattern in a body like ourselves or a bee's body and the and the honeybee colony, the colonial. So in other words, they're an organ, they're a colonial organism, not a society. So our bodies are organized with anatomy and physiology. Anatomy refers to specialized cells that are in, they're specialized in the tissues and organs. They play discrete roles in the body. 
a social insight version of that or, or the division of labor stuff that I've been talking about, the queen versus the worker and all the, the physical cast and also the temporal cast. These are sort of specialized, you know, these are specialized individuals creating a division of labor. Anatomy is also a division of labor just at the cellular level. But whenever you have anatomy, whenever you have specialization like that, you also have to have coordinating mechanisms to make sure that all the different disconnected pieces work with a unity of purpose. And so a good example of that from our own bodies is the fight or flight response, which I'm kind of trying to illustrate here with this cheetah and the gazelle. So when the gazelle, when the prey sees the predator, there's a surge of adrenaline, just like we get in our fight or flight response. And the adrenaline is a, is a signaling messenger. It's a signaling, you know, uh, chemical. It, it sends a, a signal to all the cells in the body to, to rapidly change their behavior for the new purpose, you know, either the fighting or the, or the running away. And what's interesting is that it's not the same, every cell doesn't respond in the same way. So the, the nervous system, the brain and the cardiovascular system are rapidly sort of increased and excited by the adrenaline, right? Because you have to be ready to run away or fight, you have to be alert and you have to be ready to exert a lot of energy, right? But the digestive system, for example, it has the opposite effect. When it receives that surge of adrenaline, it shuts down. And so instead of continuing digestion, instead of causing excretion, things like that, all those activities are shut down, right? So when you're running for your life, you don't wanna to have to stop and do a number two, right? You don't even wanna have those, those feelings. And so you may have had this yourself when you do public speaking, when you get in front of a crowd, and you suddenly, you know, you, you don't notice it because you're, you know, you're, you're, you're tuned in to what you're doing, but you're, you don't, the reason you very rarely have to, to, to stop to go to the bathroom is because the surge of adrenaline you get shuts all that stuff down until the, until the stress is over. So that stressful, you know, thing shuts down the important, but not right now important tasks like digestion and, and excretion and things like that. And that alerts your body. So what's interesting is that all these different cells in your body and these, these coordinating, these, these specialized things, they have to know what the big picture is, right? And so coordination is, what's the big picture? What should I be doing right now? And so physiology is about coordinating all these different specialized parts. So social insects do coordination as well. Their pheromones are for that. We've identified 50 pheromones already in the honeybee. And they're about communicating, the bees communicating with each other to tell each other what's going on. They also have a bunch of mechanical signals like the waggle dance, and the tremble dance, and all these dances. They also serve to coordinate activities to make sure everybody's on the same page, everybody's working together. For the mechanical signals, almost all of them are associated with coordinating the activities between the foragers and the middle-aged bees that are doing food processing and building. So in a nutshell, the, you can't, if you're in, the, in terms of collecting nectar and making honey, the people think of that as a foraging activity. The foragers, you know, they they make the honey, but the foragers just collect the nectar, right? And so if there's no bees, if there's no middle-aged bees to receive the nectar loads, then foraging shuts down. So people have done lots of experiments where they remove the nectar process, the nectar receivers, and as soon as they're gone, foraging shuts down. And it's common sense, right? If they can't unload their, their nectar loads, they stop foraging. Foraging shuts down. So same thing with building the comb, right? If they run out of space and there's no more place for the, the food to go, then again, they, the foraging shuts down. So the middle-aged bees have to make sure that there are enough of them working on receiving that they can balance how many foragers are active right now. And they also have to make sure that they're ahead on making comb. And so they have to make sure they always have enough comb that's empty and ready to go for storage. And so most of the signals like the tremble dance and the stop signal and the piping signal, all of these are done by the foragers and they're sent to the middle-aged bees to let them know how much foraging is going on and how much of how much work they should be devoting to nectar processing and to food building and, and to comb building. So that's sort of in a nutshell how the superorganism idea works. It's an idea that there's uh, there's specialization, but there's also coordinating mechanisms both within our bodies and within a social insect colony, such that it's best to think of a social insect colony as a colonial organism and not as a society. So a society is like what we have, or wolves, or lions, where we have a bunch of individuals. We're part of the social system, but we're not like a cog in the machine, right? Like we're individuals, we have our own agendas. Whereas a, a bee is better thought of as a cog in a machine. You know, she doesn't have her own agenda. She's just a cog in this machine, just like your liver cell or your heart cell or your nerve cell is a cog in the machine that makes up you.
the last thing is like sometimes people get caught up on the super part of the super organism expression. It's not meant to to sort of give the idea that these are enormously complicated organisms. They're actually simple organisms. They're they're kind of like sponges, jellyfish, echinoderms, you know, sea stars. They're sort of that level of complexity. These animals have a few tissue types. They have a simple nerve net. They have a handful of, of hormones, very much like a social insect colony. Whereas we have hundreds of tissue types. We have huge numbers of hormones. We have a you know a, a nervous system that's astronomical in its complexity. And so we're a, we're sort of you know we're an incredibly complex derived organism. The honeybee colony is a relatively a much much simpler organism. But we're both organisms in that we have you know specialization and coordinating mechanisms to sort of, you know, maximize work effort. So that's kind of what I have for the, for the talk about division of labor. All right, thank you so much. Oh, I'm glad that you you put that there. So- Yeah, so I have a couple of books that I've, I've written. They're available on Amazon and- Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, great books. I uh, encourage folks to visit your local library, order them on Amazon, learn lots. As uh, we heard this evening, uh, there is so much to know. We could probably live 10 lifetimes and still not truly understand uh, the intimacies of the communication within a honeybee hive. That's for sure. It's amazing. Um, we do have some great questions in the chat um can bees revert to younger behavior like going from middle age back to mostly acting as a nurse bee they can and a bunch of people have studied it it's sort of given i think a false impression of how it works so if you do this experiment where you remove the younger bees and you just populate the hive with foragers it's actually not that hard to do. So if you, if you, I don't know if you've removed your hives, you know that the foragers go back to, to move the hive a certain distance, because otherwise the foragers will go back to where the old hive was. Yeah. And so the way you do this experiment is you move the hive and then you put a new hive there with, with, you know, frames of larva and honey and pollen and stuff. But so you basically move all the young bees away. You put a new hive there, the foragers come back and now you have a hive that's just composed of foragers. When you do this experiment, what you find is that some of the foragers do revert to being nurses. They turn back on their hypopharyngeal glands and they start producing brood food. But the hypopharyngeal glands never get as large as they are in nurses. And they basically are sort of, they're kind of crappy nurses. You know, they like, I think, you know, one real nurse is probably worth like four or five reverted nurses. And then what you also notice in that situation is that most of the larvae die. No matter how few of them there are, they, you see that the larvae crawl out and they and they die, they starve and, because the foragers just aren't very good at it. So you get and, you, and not that many of them actually revert. And so they do have the they have some capacity to revert, but it's it's pretty small. It's probably like a more of a, an emergency type situation to, to get just to survive, but not to thrive. They can't take the places of the nurses, but they can they can do enough to keep the colony alive, basically until the queen can lay more eggs and they can rear more more young. Okay, thank you. So it's important and adaptive, but it's not something that they would normally do. Uh, in the next five minutes, we have three more questions. Uh, is there a known percentage for each, each cast in a hive at one given moment, like i.e. 25% are nurse bees, 25% are... Um, MABs, et cetera. What, what is your thought on that? There is kind of a an optimal cast ratio, but it varies through the year. And so in the spring, a honeybee colony is focusing most of its energy on growth and not so much on, on, on food storage. And so most of the food they collect in the spring goes into making more bees. And so they're trying to grow as quickly as possible and then swarm. And then after that, later in the season, they, they transition from trying to grow to trying to store as, enough food to get through the winter. And so when they're in early in the season, there's a, the ratio of nurses to, to older bees, there's more nurses because they're doing more brood rearing. They're trying to grow as quickly as possible. So the ratio is, is skewed for nurses in the spring. Then later in the, in the summer and in the fall, when they're trying to collect all the food that they can, and they're not rearing too many more young bees, then the ratio is strongly skewed towards the foragers. 
So there is a there is a optimal ratio, but but it depends on what the bees are trying to accomplish. And the two main things that they're trying to accomplish are they're trying to grow as quickly as possible in the spring, and they're focused on food storage in the midsummer to to late. Summer. So that's a good segue into this next question. Does the queen have any influence in directing foraging, nursing, or uh, collecting? I think the word. I mean, is other it. than just being alive, being healthy, she doesn't really direct anything. You know, she basically lays eggs, and then she signals her fertility. You know, she signals her presence and her fertility, and then how many eggs she's laying is a function of how much the nurses are feeding her. But the more they feed her, the more she'll lay. The less they feed her, the less she lays. And then when it comes to getting ready to swarm, they also are, you know, they're, they they feed her less to slim her down so she can fly. They also use the shaking signal. They're constantly, they're giving her thousands of shaking signals before swarming. It's another sort of, you think it's a signal to change her physiology to get her ready for flight as well. But basically all the information processing is being done by the, by the other bees. And so bees do what's called collective decision-making they don't really make decisions as individuals. They they sort of pool all of their information to form a collective kind of decision. And that takes hundreds or thousands of individuals. So the queen is no smarter than any other bee. She's just one bee. She just happens to be the one that lays the eggs. So she's the most important bee, but she doesn't have access to any more information than any other bee. She can't really make decisions. The decisions are made collectively and they're made by the other bees. Hmm. Wow. So is there a term for bees reverting back in task or age? They're called reverted nurses. Reverted nurses. Okay. Yeah. But okay. you pretty much only see it in experimental. Well, you you, you might see it if they're in, under exceptional circumstances. Like I think the natural context in which you might see it is in swarming. Right after swarming, the ratio of bees in the different casts can be skewed a little bit. And so there can be some reversion or acceleration. Um, you can also see it maybe if there was a predation event and lots of the hive was killed, lots of the, the hive bees were killed and the foragers came back. I guess you could see it then. But the main context in which you see it, I think, is an experiment in which experimenters go in and remove the young bees. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak to caste, please, just briefly? Uh, your definition of caste. I, I heard uh, nurse. I heard forager. I I heard like in hive uh, worker. You've got uh, various tasks that like um, uh, wax uh, comb builder, um, and then cast in terms of worker queen, and some people include you know at a at a different level drone as cast. So from that perspective, do you see? two casts or three? Well, there's sort of a technical meaning of cast and mm -hmm. then also a casual meaning mm -hmm. because where sort of equivocation comes in. Mm -hmm. I think in general, cast refers to individuals that have a specialized task repertoire. They have sort of specialized behavior. So in terms of like a bee could do everything the colony does and there would be no division of labor. That There would be no cast there as well. And so expression cast is meant to sort of capture the idea that an individual has a specialized role in the nest. And that goes along with behavior and physiology and development. So it basically just means specialized role, an individual with a specialized role. And so from that perspective, the queen is a cast. It's a re she's a reproductive cast. The workers are also a cast because they're both specialized roles. But then also within the workers, the, the newly emerged bees, the nurses, the middle-aged bees, and the foragers are also specialized roles. Huh. And so I would limit it to that, to those, me, to that's those the caste two. system. Okay. Yeah. And so there's there, everything else that people refer to as caste, I don't think of as, as caste. So for, for example, the drones, calling them a caste, I mean, they just don't work in this. They don't do anything, right? And so I don't, they're not really specialized. They're just not, they're just reloaders. Okay. I mean, they're That's... not freeloaders from an evolutionary perspective. I mean, they're important for the colony because they spread the colony's genes, right? But in terms of organization and work and having a specialized role in the nest, they don't have a specialized role. You know, they don't do anything. You know, they don't help with anything. So I wouldn't call them a cast. And so for me, it's just specialized, a bee with a specialized role in the nest. And then you can be, you could be, you know, you could be creative with that. Like you could say the guards are a cast, but I don't think it's sort of, it doesn't encompass 
the the idea that the specialized role has a a, a physiological and a basis and a you know, hormonal basis because if you watch a guard bee, they don't guard. That's not their. That's not they. They very quickly go from guarding to processing food to building the nest. They're just middle aged bees. So if you watch them for the rest of the day, guards do these other middle aged bee tasks, and they're bouncing around between these different tasks in the middle aged bee task repertoire. You don't see them bouncing back to nursing tasks. You don't see them deciding to go get some pollen or something, right? They, they're they a middle-aged bee. And, and as a middle-aged bee, you can do these 12 different things. And as a nurse, you can do these five different things. And as a forager, you can do these five or six different things. And so the bees bounce around between these things. And then some of them spend more time on one task than the others, but they're never just specialized on one. They always are happy to do all of the tasks that are in that cast repertoire. Mm, that's really helpful. I appreciate the clarity around the cast system, if you will, within the hive. Thank you. It's helpful to put into perspective the division of labor, which you covered uh, and answered a lot of questions. And you got uh, a lot of thank yous in the chat. And on behalf of the California Master Beekeeper Program at UC Davis, Dr. Brian Johnson, thank you for your generosity of time your wealth of insight and knowledge. And again, uh, plug for your book, Honeybee Biology. Check it out. It is hot off the press. You, and uh, the forward is written by Tom Seeley, right? So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time this evening. And, yeah, thanks for having uh, me. I enjoyed it. Yeah. We wish everybody uh, well. Be well. Happy beekeeping. Take care. Take care.